<laughs> so I'm, I'm Jane Wales, um, and, um, and I now have a microphone. Um, I just want to first thank you so much all for being here. I know you all traveled from very far. I want to thank the Woodmark Group for making this possible. And I also want to thank Advancement Resources and GG&A and Sterling Foundation um, Management for contributing to making this, um, this almost three-day event uh, happen. We're really grateful to all of you. Of course, I want to thank my boss, Walter Isaacson, and thank Elliot Gerson, who actually even, Elliot has even donated his, his physician brother to the cause. So, um, uh, well, So over the next couple of days, we're going to be talking about scientific discovery, we're going to be talking about technology advancements, we're going to be talking about systems, we're going to be talking about policy. But of course, in the end, this is all about people. Um, it's people that motivate us, it's people that inspire us to, to push hard and to dig deep and to look forward and to persevere uh, in an effort to try to put children first. And most importantly, to do so together as a group. And so tonight, we're going to hear from a great playwright uh, and a great actor who is going to introduce us to, I think, four people. Uh, it may be five. She sometimes fools me. Um, who are seized by themselves, seized by the very issues that, that bring you here for these two days to talk about putting children first. Um, Anna Dever Smith has asked that I introduce her, but she's done something unusual. She asked that I introduce her after uh, her performance. And the reason is that Anna feels that tonight is not about Anna. It's about the individual she's about to introduce you to. So please join me in welcoming Anna to the stage. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, so what I'm gonna be doing now for the next 23 to 25 minutes is um, excerpts from uh, interviews that I've done over time. Um, and I'm hoping that, because I haven't really worked specifically in the space of children, uh, I'm hoping that what I am able to do here is to pepper a little bit of what uh, Peter Schwartz um, talked to you about earlier. And, try to give maybe a bit of a, a context for some of the scenario um, doing, so the creative act that you're going to do. So uh, I started interviewing people a long time ago on a project of mine called On the Road to Search for American Character that has really been uh, what my creative and professional life has been about. That's really been the center of it. Um, with the idea of putting myself in people's words the way that you would think about putting yourself in people's shoes in order to try to absorb America through the words. My grandfather had said when I was a little girl, if you say a word often enough, it becomes you. So I'm trying to become this country by saying the words and obviously being influenced by other artists like Whitman who want to do a similar thing. So everything that you're going to hear now is verbatim from an interview and I think of each of these small little excerpts, because they're not obviously a complete play, I think of all of them as um, tiny stories, tiny stories with little pearls of wisdom. And I have to uh, thank Jane not only for inviting me, but also for being co-curator. Um, I shared some of my archive with me, and so uh, she uh, weighed in on, on what would be good for, for you all, because she knew the crowd better than I. And one of the people she asked me to um, present is somebody that I don't get to perform very much, so it's really, uh, really exciting, because this person is no stranger to the Aspen Institute. It's Michael Sandel, the ethicist, uh, and great uh, teacher at Harvard. And this little part of his interview, I call the crooked timber of humanity. And I hope what this makes, uh, causes us to think about is that there's all different kinds of children right now in our society, and there are a certain group of children that we do pay an enormous amount of attention to. Could we get some of the lights out in the house, the gentleman in the back? Um, that we do pay an enormous attention to. And if you know Dr. Sandell, you know that he has questions about that. Um, so the crooked timber of humanity. 
We are longing for perfection, but I think it's a perfection that's not for its own sake, but for the sake of gaining an edge in an intensely competitive society. It's the perfection that parents are obsessed with for their children when they scramble for every conceivable edge to get them into the best, not college, not even private school, but um, preschool. And what we're doing in the name of helping our children and equipping our children, we're gradually, without being aware of it, turning parenting into manufacturing, as if the child were a consumer good. You know, in the 20s and 30s, there were state fairs that awarded prizes called fittest family prizes. And you would go to a state fair, and alongside the livestock competitions, where they would give blue ribbons for the best cattle or the best bred pig, they were doing the same for human beings. And people would enter, and you know, they would give their genetic information, their medical history, and they would award prizes for the fittest families, just the way they gave, you know, gold medals for the fittest cattle and the best bred pig. The current day drive for perfection goes back to the eugenics movement of the early part of the 20th century in this country. Well, well, what is eugenics? Eugenics gained its momentum in the early part of the 20th century. The idea was we want to lift up the genetic capacities of the next generation. We want to improve, as they put it, the germ plasm. We want to breed for success. Now, this wasn't just right wing cranks. This was central to a certain strand of the American progressive movement. In the majority of American states, in the 20s and 30s, they had forced sterilization laws that provided for the forced sterilization of the so-called undesirable feeble-minded for the sake of lifting up the genetic profile of the whole society. Theodore Roosevelt was a eugenicist. Margaret Sanger was a notorious eugenicist, and her case for birth birth control was largely cast in eugenic terms. So this current day drive for the perfection of our children goes back to this eugenic movement. Oh, by the way, Oliver Wendell Holmes, famous American jurist, wrote uh, in a Supreme Court opinion upholding one of those forced sterilization laws ended with this infamous line, three Three generations of imbeciles is enough. That's Oliver Wendell Holmes. So these are not right wing marginal cranks. Then mid 20th century, the Nazis give eugenics a bad name and eugenics is discredited for a time. But, but now in our day, it has, it has a kind of a rebirth, detached from the kind of coercive reach of the state. So forced sterilization laws, those are discredited. But instead of coercive state mandated eugenics, we have free market eugenics, privatized eugenics, where they, those who control, who are trying to control the genetic future for the sake of perfection are not trying to lift up the society as a whole. They're trying to lift up their own kids prospects to compete more effectively, to be stronger, to be taller, to be smarter, to be more physically attractive, to be better athletes. And some people say, well, that's just fine. So long as it's not coercive, parents should be free to pursue whatever advantage they want for their children. But I still think that the drive for perfection is tinged with the moral taint of the eugenic project. What happens to us as parents and as citizens when we lose our capacity to be open to the unbidden? Openness to the unbidden. Openness to the unbidden, it's, it's, it's a spiritual um, disposition. It's, it's an orientation to the world. It, it, it's the openness to that which is unpredicted or maybe unfamiliar, especially when we're talking about children or families. The, openness to the unbidden is bound up with the unconditional love of parents for children and even in society as a whole. It's the willingness to be open 
to the unbidden and to that which is unpredicted and maybe unfamiliar. That is a virtue, not only of parenting, it's a civic virtue that we desperately need and it's increasingly in short supply. Well, you know, Immanuel Kant had this wonderful phrase, the crooked timber of humanity. He said, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. That's Michael Sandow. So, you know, we want uh, children to be healthy, we want the nation to be healthy, and uh, we know that there are so many things that we can do uh, to provide prevention. We can be proactive about health, and I know that that's a lot of what you're going to talk about, and those of you who are in, in the company of children and parents also know that that's exactly the place where we find the unbidden. And so this woman is someone I really uh, wanted you to meet who is, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Who is uh, a woman who I met when I was researching my last play, Let Me Down Easy, um, at MD Anderson Hospital in Texas where I did a lot of research. Uh, she is the mother of, of at the time an eight-year-old uh, who had leukemia. And, uh, and this is just full of what you do with the unbidden. And uh, one of the things I love about the work I do is that I'm very interested in people whose lives are in disarray because what I've learned is if I'll sit with my tape recorder in front of somebody who's lost something or something went upside down, they will show me that they have extraordinary linguistic gifts to make sense of about what is going on to them and to try to put things right side up. And so for this reason, vulnerable people like Angie Farmer really interest me. And uh, here they are about to leave the hospital after a long time there, Micah's leukemia. At one point in time, they said that Micah would not survive the night. And we've been there several times with him. The harsh reality is that the beautiful child that I am going to take out of this hospital, cancer-free, is not the beautiful child that I brought in to this hospital. I brought in this little five-year-old, platinum blonde, tiny little boy, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But he has suffered so much physically, and he has seen more in his little lifetime than most of us will ever read about, see, experience, and our whole group of people will never even know that many bad experiences. Micah, he actually, um, he says that he heard the audible voice of God that told him that he was going to survive. He said that God told him that he would get better and that he would get off of that pole when he was in the ICU and he was dying, and he did. He sure did. Never underestimate the power of the human spirit's will to survive. If you can grab that, if you, if you can nurture that, if you can feed that, you can go beyond what medicine says is possible. Living on the edge here, 
has changed some things. My marriage is going to suffer. Oh, yeah. You can't live that far apart in two different worlds for that period of time. And I've been married 24 years. I live in a portal between life and death where every day people are chosen. Some are chosen to go and some are granted their stay. But my husband, he, he, whereas he's there doing the normal things, going to the job, washing cars, baseball games and all that. The worlds are at different poles. I'm here. Use every opportunity to make today a party. Nobody, nobody is promised tomorrow. We all say that, but you don't understand it until you've gone through this battle. If I can go to the zoo, I don't care if it's mask and glove and gown and everybody points and stares, we're gone. If he wants to go for a walk at 2 o'clock in the morning, that's what we're doing. If it's pretty today and yeah, I need to go to the laundry, I need to go to the cleaners and do this or that, but it would be a good day to go fishing, load them up. That's what it's about. Living. That's what you learn from this experience. You don't learn how to die. You learn how to live. And that's Angie Farmer. That's Angie Farmer putting, um, putting her child first uh, and, and learning from that situation of being in the unbidden. I want to tell you one quick story. So, so the first performance of this, of my show, we did in New Haven, and we always call all of the people that I've interviewed to invite them, and we got a hold of her in Texas, and she said, well, do they have motels in New Haven? Because <laughs> I would really like to come, and I'll try to put the money together, and one of the very nice people on the board paid for her, her to come to fly to New Haven with Micah, her son, and her husband. And uh, Micah, actually, right after I had interviewed him, the cancer came back, and he ultimately had to have a bone transplant. But my favorite thing was his father packed him for opening night of the show, and instead of packing his dress shoes, he packed his tap shoes. <laughs> So at the, you know, sort of patron's dinner, everybody heard this tap, 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 tap. <laughs> that was Micah alive and well. <laughs> so I know when you look at the overall picture, you will certainly deal with the fact that in this country we have such a disparity of resources. And what I think is so important as we think about uh, uh, making a world where children of first is to bring front and center the role of empathy, the role of the empathic. And so this is just a brief excerpt from an extraordinary young doctor who I met when I went down to New Orleans uh, right after Katrina. Uh, young, white doctor, went to Barnard, um, and full of, full of compassion, and full of energy and vinegar and all that other stuff. And uh, this is just a little bit of something that she experienced that I think will also uh, ring some bells for some of you. It, it has a little bit of strong language, but yeah, you can hang it. It's verbatim. <laughs> you have people that start out assholes and they end up assholes. And they may even wind up bigger assholes. <laughs> the biggest asshole I ever met in my training experience? God, there's so many. <laughs> um, God, it's so tough. Oh, I know. Oh, I remember him. I, ca I can't remember his name, but he was such an asshole. He was a resident when I was a medical student, and he was in OBGYN. I think a lot of that OBGYN stuff really kind of sort of hit a nerve with me. And he was kind of like, you know, he was fully planning. He was one of these guys who was like, oh, I can't wait to get out of Charity Hospital, this freaking hellhole, these people, blah, blah, blah. Because probably the least pleasant part of my job at Charity Hospital, a public hospital in New Orleans, 
is I see people who come in to train at Charity, and like I always thought that we had a tremendous opportunity to see what it would be like in some sense, I mean, without living it, to be poor and to open your heart and open your mind to these fantastic people that we had coming to our hospital as patients. You know, but privileged students come from all over to train at Charity, but they come with their own baggage about what Charity is, about the Charity population, our population. It's kind of a common phrase. It's like our population, meaning the people that we take care of and are distancing ourselves from. And it will because people come with their own racism and their own classism. And well, this guy, this guy was just fully intending to, you know, set up, I'm sure, a very fan, because he was constantly talking about, oh, when I get out, I'm not going to have these kind of patients, translation, poor, black, no prenatal care, blah, blah, blah. One night we were on call and a girl came into the hospital with pelvic inflammatory disease. And so we were called to the emergency room. And it's tremendously painful to be examined when you have um, fulminant um, pelvic inflammatory disease. And she was 13. And she was there with an aunt, but her aunt was not in the room. In fact, if I remember right, I think this guy made her aunt leave the room. And he did a pelvic exam on her, and she was so in so much pain and screaming out. And he said to her, wait a minute, I want to get it right. Oh, what's your problem? Don't tell me you haven't had something bigger than these two fingers up there, or you wouldn't have gotten this to begin with. I mean, he was my resident. So here I am, I was a medical student. I was a third year medical student. He was a resident, he was a second year resident. He was several levels above me. I was so shocked and um, crestfallen and so really beat myself up afterwards that I didn't do, I don't know what, punch him. But I did say to him when, I were out, when we were out of her earshot, I said, I cannot believe that you would treat somebody like that. And I cannot believe, this is disgusting to me. And he said, and I remember this because it's such the typical line. He said, oh, wait till you're in my spot, which is that faux jaded, which is just like, oh, wait until you've seen so many 12 year olds with pelvic inflammatory disease. What, you become an asshole? I mean, what I loved so much about working at Charity Hospital, a public hospital in New Orleans, every single patient who walks through that door has gotten the shit end of the stick in life, period. But through my interactions with them, I could treat them like they were the Saudi Arabian princess coming to the Mayo Clinic because it's that, it's that interaction. There is, there is absolutely no reason why I can't give everybody top of the line best medical care. <laughs> so, you know, something that came up here my first summer here, 2006, as an artist in residence was on an education panel, the whole idea that we need an imagination in this country that helps us remember that all children are our children. They all need to be well for the sake of the country. And that's why I love Kirsten Kurtz Burke so much. So the next person is no stranger to you. Um, Phil Pizzo, he's here. I love you, Phil. And I have to publicly thank Phil for making so much of my project uh, Let Me Down Easy uh, possible. I had so many opportunities to experiment with the material, to find new material, and also to do extraordinary outreach, uh, even into medical schools at, who are training uh, doctors because of Phil's generosity and the way that he uh, really just allowed me to be one of them. And this is such an important uh, uh, piece, this piece by Phil, because I think it helps us with the larger economic context that you all know about, so may as well state it in terms of how you think about putting children first, and this is called Takes a Lot of Time. 
What I fear is happening is we are slipping into a healthcare system in this country that will look very much, unless it's changed dramatically, very much like that of a developing nation. Well, think about it. Our survival projections on a worldwide basis are much higher than they've been in the past, but those can be radically changed by a couple of significant factors. One of them, which is preventable, is the epidemic of obesity. Obesity in its own right will engender the evolution of so many other morbid diseases that it will erode much of the progress that has been made in longevity and survival up until now into this country. And secondly, we have new infectious diseases that challenge us year in and year out, and those two will make a tremendous, a tremendous difference drug companies on the news, largely promising the merits of sexual stimulants like Viagra and paying little attention to uh, vaccines and medications that have a benefit for the common illness. Now, our priorities have obviously been skewed in the wrong direction. The whole focus right now on health care reform is largely an economic one. The, uh, uh, but underlying that are a huge, a huge set of cultural views and expectations. The whole difficult challenge of rationing or regulating health care is going to have to be a part of this public debate. We spend a significant portion of our health care dollars uh, on the last six or eight months of life, right? It would be all right if that led to success, but the fact that it simply results ultimately in death and sometimes with as many complications as benefits is really an important part of this dialogue. If we were in another nation that regulated health care, that discussion would happen. How much should we spend on certain procedures and should we in some ways govern when care ends? You know, when I hear the debate go on from members of our Congress, they'll say, well, I don't want you to tell me what my grandmother should get or my mother should get. But the reality ultimately is that each of us has to make some decisions about that. We do it in a way, on an individual level, and then we slip into a kind of a slippery slope with one parent or child or loved one uh, saying do this when the doing it isn't going to have any long-term benefit. What are our expectations about what constitutes reasonable care? At the beginning and towards the end is going to have to be a part of this public debate because it tracks right to the economics that we're going to spend. You know, in addition to being a pediatrician, I'm also an oncologist. There was a study that was done just a couple of years ago that asked whether if oncologists, how often did they um, introduce to their uh, patient that they were at the end of known therapy? Rare. Rarely done. Rarely does the dialogue take place. That you know, we we have expended a reasonable or a reasoned amount of treatment, and we now need to move towards comfort and care. And I think that represents a cultural phenomenon that doesn't exist throughout the world. I mean, you've traveled the world, you know how people talk about death and dying in other societies. It's different from the way we do it here. And I think it represents a kind of a cultural mythology that has grown up not over a year or two or decades, but decades of time in which we have slowly convinced ourselves that more is better. We can't afford to have a system like this. The cultural expectation is every individual believes that he or she should get the most advanced health care on demand. I can remember as a child, so this is growing up in the 1950s, when doctors made um, house calls. When the doctor came to my house and did an examination, if the doctor didn't do something, you know, uh, give a shot or give the medication some kind of, um, usually a shot, uh, it was as if they'd never come. Uh, why did we call you if you didn't do something? The kind of dialogue that I describe that the doctor may need to have with her or his patient about death and dying may be one that a medical student or even a resident never has organized supervision around. Shocking, isn't it? Shocking. And I think there are probably at least two or more reasons why that doesn't happen as much as it should. 
One is a lack of skill and sophistication. The other is in some ways the concern that as you begin to move um, towards that um, discussion that you're uh, get taking away hope from a patient. And then a third, which is a, a hard one for me to say, but I think nonetheless represents an honest reflection is that it takes a lot of time. Phil Pizzo. Uh, uh, very briefly, also from Stanford, uh, pediatrician, professor of pediatrics, uh, Dr. Fernando Mendoza, childhood obesity. Issues of obesity, we saw it in the Latino community, first in the 1980s, 1980. It was clear from the 70s that, you know, that Latino kids had what we called short plump syndrome, <laughs> which was that they were a little shorter and they were more heavier than the U.S. population. And African American kids were also larger. It, it doesn't become an issue unless it becomes an issue in the white kids. And you know, if you think about it, if we started paying attention in 1980, as though those children were all of our children, we'd be a lot further along in terms of the things we might know how to do to confront what's now a national problem. And lastly, if there's anybody who I met in doing 300 and some interviews, 300, over 320 interviews on three continents, it's a woman who I met uh, a white South African who I met in uh, Johannesburg who has an orphanage for children who are dying of AIDS. She doesn't have any children of her own. She adopted a little child that the police found on the road uh, about a few hours old in a garbage bag and they brought her over to Trudy but because the baby was so little, Trudy didn't take her to the orphanage, kept her at home and raised that baby. And she has all these children who are sick, who she treats like her children. And inside of Trudy, I hope, is something that will help you in your scenarios as you think about what it means to put children first. And this is called Don't Leave Them in the Dark. I'll leave you with this. Well, last year we had four or five um, babies uh, that passed away. And this year we've had one so far. Well, what happens is they phone me any time of the night and say, this little kid is very, very sick. And so I'll go and I'll sit with the child until the child passes away. So I make sure that I'm there for every child. Oh, well, they don't know death. That's how I see it. They don't know that they're dying. They just know that they're very sick type of thing. But the older children that we've got here, the 12-year-old and the 14-year-old that we've got here, I sit and I talk with them the whole time about death. And we had one child here, Nomza. Charlene Huntergop of CNN knew Nomza very, very well. And I sat with Nomza for days and hours and telling about the virus and telling about death. And so Nomza knew that she was not going to make the weekend. And so she came to see me on the Friday afternoon. And she said that her mother had visited her the night before. And I knew that Nomza's mother had passed away six years prior to that. So I sat her down. And I said, well, now what time did your mother visit you? She said, no, it was late at night. I said, well, if you see your mother tonight again, if your mother visits you, 
to not again. You must tell her that I said thank you very, very much that I could look after you for so long. She said, no, she will. And the next morning, the Saturday morning, I came in here and Nomza was sitting on the stairs and she said that her mother had visited her the night again and that her mother said she must pack all her clothes that she's coming to fetch her, that she's going home. I promise you it was. And I walked up to her and I said, did you tell your mother that I said thank you very much? And she said, yes. And my mom said, thank you very much. And I had gone into her room. All her clothes were packed, put in plastic bags. And it was waiting for her that Sunday morning at 3 o'clock in the morning. Nomza passed away, and I made sure that I bury her next to her mommy. So her mother came and fetched her, and she knew she was going to die, and it's not a bad thing. She was prepared. She was prepared to go. All her stuff was packed. All her teddy bears were packed, and we took everything, her clothes, her teddy bears, and we put it with her in her coffin. She went very happily. She was 12 years old. Well, I just tell them that there are different stages of life. I say, you get born, and sometimes when you're born, you're sick. I said, you've got this germ in your body. We talk about the germ. We sit on the carpet, and we play. We play with the dolls. I say, look at this ugly germ that's got into the body. It's making this little child very sick, and sometimes this child has had enough, and you know they're getting sicker. You know it's getting to the next stage, and they ask questions like, what happens if I'm dead? I say, nobody can answer that. And they ask about God. And they ask about, can we come back and visit you when we date? You know, that type of thing. They always just want to say, they always just want to say, can we come back to chance? Orphanage when we date, you know, that type of thing. And I just tell them, I just say, you always in my heart. Even if you've passed away, you always in my heart. You always with me. You know, so in any case, don't leave them in the dark. Don't leave them in the dog. And that is Trudy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, we can lift up the lights. Because we've run a little bit late, I'm going to reduce my number of questions to Joanna um, and let you have the chair. So please no, take no, it. Yeah, You've been working, working hard. I, you, you've created a genre. Um, you've met presidents. You've met great artists. You've met CEOs in your interviewing process. What is it about the language of the vulnerable that has attracted you? Well, um, it's exactly what I said, which is that, you know, what I'm looking for is when people sing, I call it singing and they're talking, and that is, you know, uh, that's what I have to find out of hours and hours of interviews. And so what I've learned is that when people have had something happen that starts to fall apart, they are extremely creative in a very dramatic way of creating language that can withstand the pressure of the theater and the stage and audiences. And that is highly creative language. And so that's what's interesting to me. Now, you come from a family of educators. How did your family respond when you made the choice to teach in this compelling and powerful way of being a playwright and an actor? 
How'd your family respond, in particular, your grandmother, who you love so much? Well, um, I came from a very sort of conservative religious family, or at least my grandmother was. And, uh, you know, you couldn't uh, dance on Sunday, stuff like that, if she was around. Um, and so uh, she got word that I was going to be an actress, and she wrote me a letter. She had what we would now call Alzheimer's, and it was very scrawl, scrawled handwriting. Uh, I hear you want to be an actress. Please don't take off your clothes. <laughs> and, and there was a $5 bill in there. And it said, here's $5. Go and buy yourself a new dress. So please join me in thanking Anna DeVere Smith. She's made her grandmother proud. a.m. and that the first plenary will begin at 8 right in this room. So have a good night's sleep and I look forward to seeing you then. Yeah.